I'm Joe Kaufman, and I'm CEO of Agency Sparks. And I want to welcome you to this Marketers Insight. And I want to welcome Jessica Stafford, who is with me from autotrader.com, which is part of the Cox Automotive Group. So first of all, welcome, Jessica. We're happy to have you here. Thanks, Joe. Extremely happy to be here. Thank you. Um, so I wondered if you could just start by giving us a little bit of background. I know you've been with autotrader.com for quite a while, and you began your career on the agency side of things. So if you could talk a little bit about your career progression from your original time at the agency to all the years you've been an auto trader and now the transition to Cox Automotive Group. Sure, definitely, yeah. Um, yeah, so I've been with Auto Trader for about seven and a half, a little over seven and a half years now, um, and have had, you know, uh, amazing opportunities and a, and a great career over the last seven and a half years in a company that's grown and changed um, definitely year by year, if not more often than that. So while it's been a long time at one place, it's felt like many different places. Um, before that, like you said, coming from the digital agency side of the world and um, at a few different agencies prior, you know, having the um, opportunity to learn in that space um, a lot about the marketing and advertising world, specifically on the digital side, and learn quickly because, um, as a lot of us know, the the pace um, you tend to pack in, you know, five ten years experience in just a couple years. So um, I do feel like I was really fortunate to gain a lot of experience across the board, um, from strategy and branding to media, web development, um, interactive events, um, as well as branching a little bit into the traditional space, but I really didn't get into that area as much until moving over to um, AutoTrader and really making that leap onto the, you know, quote unquote client side, which at that point of my career I was thinking, am I really ready for that? Do I really want to commit to one brand? It's really exciting and challenging working across several brands and, and getting to figure out what um, what is success for that company, what is success for that brand, and how can we really make an impact and moving into um, just one brand. But really at that point it was an opportunity to um, dig in, get a little bit more on the business side of, of advertising and marketing, um, really truly understand what those challenges are and apply the knowledge that I learned on the agency side of how to um, tackle those challenges. So came over to AutoTrader when it was um, just AutoTrader.com at that point, you know, majority owned by Cox since the beginning, but um, we were focused on one brand and on the consumer marketing side of that brand, and I worked across a lot of our different distribution partnerships, so it was a little bit of business development, a little bit of marketing and advertising, a little bit of web development, working on integrated partnerships where we went out to different brands, different websites, and said, you don't have an automotive classified section. That's what we're good at. Let us power um, your experience. And that evolved into um, working across all of our digital marketing. And then as the landscape um, and industry shifted and changed, it became you know less, less important to be digital versus traditional. And we did a lot to combine and create more integrated approaches to that. So I started working across a lot more of the traditional media side of the business and then um, a few years ago, we changed from just autotrader.com. Autotrader.com started acquiring different businesses in the automotive space. Um, we acquired Kelly Blue Book, which was another huge consumer brand, um, in addition to another few um, brands that are more on the B2B side of automotive, uh, better servicing car dealers, manufacturers. Um, and so we created what was then called Auto Trader Group. And um, we started our marketing department kind of grew to be able to support all of those brands. And then as of about probably six, eight weeks ago now, um, we formed officially what's called Cox Automotive. So Cox Enterprises took all of the automotive businesses that we own all of the automotive brands, which is over 20 brands, and joined them together to create Cox Automotive and create a synergy between resources, everything from marketing to HR to finance, um, and also have a better view at what we can do for our customers and consumers across the system. We said, um, you know, there's a life cycle of cars themselves, car shoppers, as well as car sellers. And if you look at the suite of businesses that we own, um, 
some of the pillars being um, like a Mannheim Auctions, which is huge in the B2B space, Kelly Blue Book and Auto Trader from a consumer standpoint, but then a lot of brand new um, companies. We, we own a company called Next Gear that is big in the financing space, a um, company called V Auto that's huge from how, um, how we influence car dealers and how they can do better at merchandising the inventory they have, as well as figuring out what kind of car inventory they need. So um, there's a lot that we did to then plot that along that life stage, kind of life cycle, and say, um, here we are as this Cox Automotive business and how we can span across all of these areas. Um, where are our gaps strategically? How should we grow? Um, how can we create synergies coming together? And so um, we're in the process of figuring that out, but um, it's a really exciting time. And um, like you said, as far as from a career standpoint, I've been able to learn a lot of new things um, and have ongoing challenges and opportunities by staying with the same company and the same brand versus, you know, moving around. So it's been a great, great ride. I want to ask you then, so your current title is Vice President of Consumer Marketing and Creative Services. So talk to me a little bit about some of the things that you and your group are responsible for there. Sure. So our team spans everything on the consumer marketing side from search engine marketing, social media, email campaigns, um, broadcast, TV and radio, um, experiential and event marketing, sports sponsorships, the whole gamut of anything that we are, are speaking to car shoppers, to consumers, and that's about half my team. And then the other side, we have about a 25-person in-house creative studio. Wow. Um, and so we have designers and writers um, and really strong um, creative resources that we use across the board servicing all of the Cox Automotive companies. Great. So uh, let's shift the topic a little bit. I know that you all work with agencies, various agencies for different things. Talk to me a little bit about how you work with agencies. What, how um, have you formed some successful agency relationships in the past and how's that worked for you? You know, we're in a unique space because of our size and our needs, right? We're kind of in the middle. So mm -hmm. um, we want the capabilities of the big, huge agencies with um, lots of skill sets and lots of manpower and lots of fire, um, but we don't want to be the little fish in the big pond. And um, so we kind of try to find the balance. How do we get the creativity, the innovation, the agility of a boutique small agency with the skill set and the capability that sometimes comes along with a big group. So um, we do a lot to find where those kind of select groups fall. Um, doesn't matter to us if they're big or small. It matters kind of how um, how the relationship develops, and we really base everything on the relationship itself. Um, we've partnered with the same um, agency we use. Um, donor currently out of Detroit on a lot of our um, offline marketing and brand strategy. We've worked with them for 15 years. So um, we really believe in building relationships, um, having very open, honest, transparent relationships with those agencies, mutual accountability and responsibility to business goals. Um, and that's how, that's the crux of how we've kind of developed strong relationships. Mm -hmm. Same thing, same thing um, from a digital standpoint. Um, currently working with 360i um, out of Atlanta and New York on some projects and then we have a lot of other agency partnerships. Um, we would love to use um, one agency for as much as we can just because we feel like it does develop that relationship even closer. Um, although we're not afraid to go outside of, of those agency relationships if we feel like there's expertise somewhere else. Um, you know, we want to work with somebody who um, really focuses and is the best at that specific area we're looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, but we treat our agencies like family. They are family. They're part of um, our team. And so we, when we succeed, we celebrate together. When we fail, we kind of figure out what happened together. And there's a lot of mutual accountability. I really feel like that's what we've been able to build over the years um, that has created bonds and um, where you know we expect anybody on the agency to talk about whether it's Auto Trader, Kelly Blue Book, whatever brand, as, as it's themselves. We yeah. versus they. Well, except the difference is that I'll bet partially because the agency's not directly working for Cox Automotive Group, you get a little bit of that outside perspective perspective knowing also work on other clients and other accounts that, that that sometimes brings you fresh thinking that maybe you couldn't have internally absolutely there's definitely a value in that and and we've worked with our agency partners to have a mix of both so 
folks that have been on our business for a long time, so they have that really pure, really strong understanding, but then bringing others in along the way, whether it's from a strategic standpoint or a creative standpoint, that could not only have just a fresh view of, of um, what our brand needs or what we should be doing, but to your point, here's some ideas of things we've done with other um, brands, with other clients, and we can build off that here. So there's definitely a need for a balance of both. Great. So how do you ensure that your agency partners challenge you and keep you thinking of new, fresh ideas? I mean, do you challenge them to bring you new, fresh thinking all the time? We do. We do. We um, and, and it's hard because I think sometimes when you do have long-standing relationships, you start to get used to um, maybe what a client would always say no to or we know that their preference isn't this, so we're not going to even bring them that idea. Right. But we also bring that up constantly and we say, don't you know? Don't hold anything back. We want to be challenged. We want you to push us outside of our comfort zone. Right. Um, and then we hold ourselves accountable to really being open to that and and um, following through on it. We've um, our last TV campaign. I could say we went through six, seven rounds of concepts, and we had something that was really good that felt very consistent with what we've done before. And we said we really wanted. We, we were not seeing something completely different. Come back to us with that idea that you thought we'd never go for. Yeah. That was what ended up winning and we moved forward with, which was interesting because it took a little bit of um, us, you know, really being open and honest with the with the partners and saying, no, no, really, we really want you to show us something that you think we're going to laugh at. And yeah. uh, you know, sometimes those are the best ideas. Yeah, I think sometimes you have to push the envelope a little bit creatively to come to even even if you scale it back to something that's more mainstream, you've got to push it a little bit to get something new. Exactly, and I, I you know, we're also I think strategically there's that angle, and then tactically we've gotten creative with compensation models even um, mm -hmm. with some of our partners in order to really fuel that creative thinking on both sides. Also, accountability on our side to be open to those things. Yeah. Great. So talk to me a little bit about how you find agencies, where you look for them, what kinds of things catch your attention when you look in that search mode, that kind of thing. I, You know, I think that the um, being so relationship driven and being a, a group, I could say out of the 20 or so people that are on the consumer advertising side of our business, um, of our team, it's all but maybe two of them have come from the agency side. And so um, it's not a prerequisite to be part of the team, but it's definitely something we consider because we like to have people who have both perspectives, maybe have worked on the brand side and the agency side because we feel like that really brings a lot to um, the full package of the capability skill set. Um, it also gives us good perspective of what we're asking our agency partners to do because we've been on the other side yeah. and so we understand what, it, what we're really asking for. Um, that being said, we also have um, a lot of great connections and, and just uh, a, a really great network among everyone. So I would say the very first place we go is word of mouth <laughs> and, uh, and, and who's had great experiences with specific agencies before. Mm -hmm. um, besides that's, that... So that's how you find the, the quote long list of that's... prospects, prospective agency partners, and then you go through a process to narrow them down from there? Absolutely, yep, and then we go through a vetting process, and if it's not a group that we know intimately, we, we do contact colleagues or past acquaintances that we know that have worked with them, worked for them, um, and get perspectives, and then we'll go through, um, when needed, a formal RFP or RFI type process for vetting, yeah. although, frankly, we try to avoid that as much as possible. <laughs> um, you know, it ends up being just such a big time and money commitment from both sides, mm -hmm. um, so as much as we can narrow it down before that, um, knowing what we're really looking for and trying to get a good gauge for um, who'd be the best shortlist, um, we try to do that ahead of time. Yeah. We also strongly believe in trial. So whenever it makes sense from a budget and a timing standpoint to just try a few agencies doing things, um, we'll partner that way and ease into a bigger relationship so we can see you know, how it works on both sides. Yeah, that's great. Well, and you can take the energy and money and time that you're spending on conducting the RFP or review process and also the time and money that the agency is spending on trying to win your business. If they can take that money and time and focus it on solving your business problem exactly. even better instead of spending it just on the, the dance that you usually would do to find each other. Absolutely, yep. So what's a, give me like at least one or two pet peeves that 
is the worst thing that agencies do when they try to get your attention? Or like, how do you like to be approached if somebody has got a fresh idea or something new that they want to bring to your attention? Sure. So I think one of our biggest pet peeves, and this is maybe gets a little bit more into that that whole pitch type of process, but something that we're pretty transparent from the beginning whenever we go into a new relationship is that we want to talk to upfront the people, or at least some of the people that will actually be on our account. Right. So, might hear this a lot, but and, and and we understand that depending on the size of the account or the size of the business, you might need to beef up a team. You might need to go out and hire, um, which is totally fine. But I think if if um, an agency is selling in a certain skill set, or um, from our perspective, the very first thing we're looking for is that relationship side. So the account team is very important. The strategic account team of understanding our business and 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 how. Um, expert we feel they are in, in what we're looking for um, is is very important. So we we the bait and switch, um, you know, yeah. the big pet peeve and, and it happens more often than um, I think we'd like it to. So that's a big um, a big difference. And and I think that would go not only for people but for um, ideas. And if if we're sold in on some big ideas that really end up not being able to come to fruition, now you're always gonna have those crazy ideas that don't yeah. come for other reasons. But or were a great idea, but they're so incredibly hard to execute that you just not really feasible right. or something. But you know, I think we just want to get a better idea of what's really um, what's really going to happen and who we're really working with ahead of time. Right. Um, and then I would just say, on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, it's we we just like everybody get so many emails and voicemails, and so. Um, whereas we really do try to answer every email, even if it's just a we're really not interested right now, but thanks. Yeah. Out at least then there's an answer. Yeah, we believe in doing that as much as possible. Although with as much as that is, um, I think that at a high level, I wouldn't say it's a bad way to connect with people because I'd rather get an email than a voicemail. It's easier for me to digest on my time. Yeah, um, keeping things more simple and concise. And my pet peeve on that side is when when uh, companies are using um, lists or automated tools, and they might. Uh, insert your name the correct way, but then the company is the wrong company. <laughs> it happens very often. Wow. And those kinds of things lose your attention right away because although I appreciate the efficiency of using a tool and making it automated, if I'm going to take the, the time to, to read into this and to check out what it is you sent me, I'm going to delete it right away if there's kind of things right. like that. Well, it's, it's like the old you know, typos on the resume. It's an easy way to eliminate somebody if they're just not really putting the time and energy to making sure that it's perfect and right. Right. Cool. Well, I, I wanted to wrap things up pretty, you know, without taking too much of your time. So tell me something interesting about you personally that maybe we don't know or something that's fun that we should know about you that you do in your free time or, or how you describe it. You know, so tell us something fun. Well, um, my free time right now is mostly spent chasing after my two and a half year old, right. uh, trying to keep up with him. He's got, you know, it's so funny. People told me this, and I thought it was so cliche. It's like he's got one speed, and that's fast. <laughs> uh, so I do a lot of that. Although, you know, uh, there's a lot of things I like to do. I'm very much appreciate and love the fine arts. I always wanted to be um, an artist, a painter, and so I try to do as much of that on the side as I can. Although not nearly as much as I'd like to. Although I feel like you know, my day-to-day -day life, uh, being able to work in marketing and then also having a team of designers um, that I get to interact with every day gives me a little bit of that on a day-to-day -day basis. So, yep. doing it more and I need to make it a priority, but... Um, well, paint, no, no better way to spend time with a two-and-a-half-year-old than paint. <laughs> true. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much for the time, Jessica. This has been a blast. And uh, we'll publish this online and then send a link so you can share with whomever you want. But I appreciate the time. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, this has been great. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.